All right, will you please pray with me? Father God, we come to you this afternoon just thanking you again for this wonderful day that you blessed us with. A day that we had got to walk around in your creation, a day that you allowed us to see, and a day that you, God, were with us because we recognize that since you were with us, we are here right now to study and to expand our knowledge about your word, your truth, your love, and your grace. And God, we ask that as we go forth in the study tonight, that you just be with us, oh God, that you open us up to your goodness and that you allow every word to just sear hearts and open minds so that we can tell people about the goodness of Jesus Christ and have a firm foundation to stand on. For this is our prayer. And in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. All right. Well, let's definitely get started uh, looking at our recap questions just to get the mind back into the study. Our first question says, true or false? In Matthew 26, we see that the disciples were so attentive to Jesus that they stayed up to watch over him when he went to pray. False. False. Oh, yeah, what happened instead? They fell asleep. They <laughs> fell asleep. Exactly, exactly. It's, the text recalls their eyes, their eyes were heavy. <laughs> and remember, that's what Jesus said, that pointed thing in verse, what, 41, where he says, the spirit is willing, but yes. the flesh is weak. Flesh is weak. <laughs> so very good. All right, looking at recap question number two. In Matthew 26 and 39, what does Jesus ask for his father to take from him? Is it a dish? Is it a cup, a saucer, or a wine glass? A cup. A cup, a cup. All right, that's it, exactly. B, it is a cup. So in piggybacking off of that, what is the meaning behind the answer given, i.e., what was the meaning of that word cup? Was it a physical cup? Did it stand for something? What was that meaning when Jesus was saying that? What did the cup signify? His suffering and crucifixion. You got it. Exactly. It totally stood for that. So basically that cup is remove that suffering that I know I'm going to have to endure if possible, if possible. Very good. Very good. And lastly, even though he was betrayed by Judas, who sent the men with clubs and swords? Uh, uh, oh, the priest. Mm -hmm. You got it. That's exactly it. The chief priests and the elders of the people. That was exactly it. They were the ones that sent them. Mm -hmm. All right. So we are definitely ready tonight. So Amen. Let, let's Amen. go ahead and get in. It was four for four. That's good. <laughs> <laughs> so remember, mm -hmm. we left with scripture. So now we're investigating the commentary behind the scripture, which was Matthew 26, 50 through 56. And will someone please read that for us? One of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew, oh, I've got a problem. Could someone else read? I've got to fix my screen. <laughs> One of those who were with Jesus stretched out his hand and drew his sword, struck the servant of the high priest and cut off his ear. Matthew doesn't tell us, but we know from John 18 and 10 that this unnamed swordsman was Peter. He will, excuse me, he will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels. Had Jesus wanted divine help at this moment, he could have had it. Read that again. He will provide me with more than 12 legions of angels. Had Jesus wanted divine help at that time, he could have had it. There, was, there were more than 12 legions of angels ready to come to his aid. With one word, Peter was willing to take on a small army of men, yet he couldn't pray with Jesus for one hour. Prayer is the best work we can do and often the most difficult. Hmm. So basically in exploring the scripture, we see that obviously Peter is the first to attack. And it seems like Peter throughout scripture has been always a bold one. Remember on the Sea of Galilee, he's saying, hey, if it is you, can I come out and walk with you? You know what I mean? We see Peter always kind of reaching out and asserting himself. And in this, he reaches out to protect and obviously cuts off the ear of one of the high priest's servants. 
And in that, Jesus actually reprimands him. I mean, basically, he lets him know if I needed help, I could call off you know, 12 <laughs> legions of angels. I didn't need wow. your sword, you know. But I love how the commentator puts it. Basically, he says, with the sword, Peter is willing to take on a small army of men. But remember, he couldn't pray with Jesus one hour. One hour. Prayer is that best work. Obviously, that's how we need to fight. That's how we need to commune, not with the physical fist. So it leads us to a thought question. What exactly is prayer? Talking to conversation. Wait. No, you're not. Go ahead. I was going to say uh, talking to God. <laughs> Correct. Correct. Basically, it's our conversation with the divine. Of course, yeah. the uh, tech, basically, uh, the definition says a request or help or expression of thanks addressed to God. So it is the time where we actually have that communion piece with him that we can talk with him. Now, is there a certain way that we have that we must pray? Uh, a certain way, yeah. Well, I All think right. there's just go ahead, go ahead. No, no, go, no, no, no. I'm just thinking well, out loud. Say there's, there's a there's a <clears throat> there's a certain respect that should be recognized while or while or when you pray. Correct. But as far as you know, a, a certain place or in you know a certain way or anything like that, uh, no for uh to pray right you can pray anywhere <laughs> no, that's true that's exactly it doesn't have to be it is a prayer going to move god more if it's in a church or in a grocery store you know <laughs> he doesn't see that you know basically you're right it is the attitude that you have and even jesus speaks with that basically be not like the pagans with their vain babbling you know basically thinking that for more words they will be heard but just have mm -hmm. that sincerity of heart so basically, that is exactly it. Communing with God and being sincere in that communion. So absolutely perfect. Absolutely perfect. There, um, I, um, there was a pastor that um, was talking about um, prayer and, and the word pray. Mm -hmm. And so she used an acronym to kind of help guide people who... Um, you know, who wanted to kind of learn how to pray, don't feel comfortable praying out loud or praying silently to themselves. And so the acronym was P was for praise. Mm -hmm. So when you, you know, you should like um, Papa said, you need to show respect and respect God. So you praise him for who he is. You praise him for what he's doing, you mm -hmm. know, whatever you want to praise him for. But the P was for praise. The R was for um, repent. Okay. It's an opportunity for us to repent when we pray. Mm -hmm. The A was for ask. Ask mm -hmm. God um, what you would like him to do for you um, or for someone else. You know, whatever you are, your request is, right. the, the A was for ask. And the Y was a yes. Like, put a yes on it because, you know, in the prayer, just believing that God is going to answer your prayers if it's in his will. Gotcha. Okay. okay. Oh, all right. That's awesome. No, that definitely is good. I mean, definitely. You always want those things to have people, you know, understand. And so that is it. No, that's really good. That's really good. I like mm -hmm. it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. okay. that, that's uh, <laughs> it's uh, <clears throat> just recently, uh, Diane and I were having a conversation and I made a, a comment to her right. about uh, what you know, what is it that I'm going to do or should be doing when we were having that conversation? So we were having a conversation. I just, I'm, I'm, I'm uh, we're both activists in the community and things. And so I you know, try to do a lot of different things. And I feel that there is something that, uh, that God's been preparing me for. Right. And so I've been searching for these things for all of um, for years. <laughs> and finally, uh, just the other day, actually two days ago, I said, you know what? Out of all the times that I prayed for, I never asked God to tell me what he wanted me to do. Mm -hmm. I always was, you know, all 
doing everything else, but actually saying, what do you want? What's the purpose you have for me? Mm -hmm. And so it, it was like uh, a, a real surreal, surreal moment because I thought, man, if I had did this years ago, then things might be different. But then I thought, well, it just took me this long to realize, you know, that. So that was, I guess, part of the plan, I guess. But that was part of the plan that, OK, there were some certain things that I had to learn, some certain experiences that I had to go through mm -hmm. and to get, you know, to get to this point. So. I'm I'm real excited now. <laughs> so I'm waiting to hear. <laughs> no, that's it. And, and you're right. It is about growth, you know, because sometimes if things come too quickly, you know, basically, and we haven't had a comprehension or an understanding or an experience. Yeah, it doesn't fall through. God knows the exact time, the exact moment. So, like mm -hmm. I said, I don't take it a miss. You know, I definitely don't take it as a missed opportunity. I think you're right. You're right where He wants you to be. <laughs> right. That's right. That's right. You may not think so, mm. but uh, that's, that's right. He, he prepares us for what he has in store. And it, if, if, the, if there's a failure, that's on our part. <laughs> Amen. That's definitely it. Definitely it. Any other thoughts about prayer before we go forward? All right. Will someone please read the commentary looking at Matthew 26, uh, 50 through 56? Just continue with the uh, uh, enduring word. All this was done that the scriptures of the prophets might be fulfilled with all power at his disposal. Jesus was in total command. He was not the victim of circumstance, but he managed circumstances for the fulfillment of prophecy. Then all the disciples forsook him and fled. At this point, all the disciples scattered, running for their own safety. A few, Peter and John at least, fo followed back to see what would happen at a distance. None of them stood beside Jesus and said, I have given my life to this man. What you accuse him of, you may accuse me of also. Instead, mm -hmm. it was fulfilled what Jesus said. All of you will be made to stumble because of me. Matthew 26, chapter, verse 31. Uh, it, it is amazing. You know, I mean, remember, these men had ate with Jesus. They had, you know, had the supper. They had been with him in ministry. They had seen him do all of these wonderful things. And yet, and still, they couldn't stand. You know, and like I said, it definitely is a testament, you know, because I say that uh, we, we can go to church. We can be involved in Bible study. We can be an active member in our church family and community. But what, what does that picture look like when we're on our jobs? And, and see, mm -hmm. are, you know, people say an untidy joke, <laughs> you know? I mean, do we still display those things? Are we still that authentic person that we were on Sunday that we are on Monday through Saturday? And so, and it's not done. And obviously we're all human and we all have our faults, but it's just amazing that you don't even see one, you know what I mean? But right. Jesus had said it, so it shouldn't be a surprise. <laughs> no, that's right. And like you said, Pastor, oh, I'm sorry. I do, think, I, I do think that's a reflection that man is weak, you know, um, that they were with him this whole time, but when push came to shove, they gave into the weakness and they fled. Um, yeah. Wow. Mm -hmm. so, man, that's definitely it to tell you. You know, like I said, it looks at how we respond in certain things. Right. You know, do right. what do we stand for when it comes to standing for the principles and the truth of Christ or of the word? So yeah, you're right, definitely. I like what it said in the commentary that he did not succumb to circumstances. He mm. dealt with the circumstance. Mm. Amen. Amen. That's yeah, powerful. He didn't say it quite that way, but <laughs> no, yeah. well, yeah. you, you doctor it up pretty good. I like it. <laughs> <laughs> so let us get to study question. It's four in, and it says, When Christ was arrested, what did the disciples do? They hid. They hid. They fled. And there was one particular one, though. What did he do? Oh, Peter followed behind him at a distance. At a distance. <laughs> but before he followed, he did something else. Oh, where oh, he slashed off the ear. <laughs> <laughs> so we have 
Anish Peter initially attacked, but in the end, uh, it all fled. Uh, yeah. It's definitely it. That is definitely it. Right. I can't believe that. They've been walking with the man all that time, and then they just. Mm-hmm. That's what we do. Right. <laughs> it's true. It's, it's yeah. very true. Human nature comes into self preservation. And even <laughs> if they had life itself there, God, the personification of God Almighty, they still didn't comprehend that they didn't need all that. So they didn't need to try to protect. He was there, their protection. But as you say, yeah. we, these guys had swords and clubs, and, you know, it was just Jesus, you know. So they, they ran, they ran, they ran. So let us read scripture, Matthew, the 26th chapter, verses 57 through 63. Will someone please read for us? Those who had arrested Jesus took him to Caiaphas, the high priest. Say it again, sir. Caiaphas. Caiaphas, the Mm -hmm. high priest, where the teachers of the law and the elders had assembled. But Peter followed him at a distance, right up to the courtyard of the high priest. He entered and sat down with the guards to see the outcome. The chief priest and the whole Sanhedrin were looking for false evidence against Jesus so that they could put him to death, but they did not find any, though many false witnesses came forward. Finally, two came forward and declared, this fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and rebuild it in three days. Then the high priest stood up and said to Jesus, are you not going to answer? What is this testimony that these men are bringing against you? But Jesus remained silent. The high priest said to him, I charge you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Messiah, the son of God. Hmm. So we see Hmm. basically Jesus being taken before that whole group, that Sanhedrin. And basically, of course, trumped up charges are starting to come forth. And Jesus is extremely stoic, and that actually makes the priest mad that he's not emotional, you know, that he's not breaking down, that he's not, you know, asking for forgiveness. Forgiveness for what? He didn't do anything, you know? <laughs> so, needless to say, they start bringing these accusations. So this actually is a real powerful piece with it. So let's look at the commentary, and I wanted us actually to look down deeper at that Sanhedrin too. So will someone please read the commentary? Mm. <clears throat> and those who had laid hold of Jesus led him away to Cyrus, the high priest. This was not the first appearance of Jesus before a judge or official on the night of his betrayal. On that night and the day of his crucifixion, Jesus actually stood in trial several times before different judges. Before Jesus came to the home of Cyrus, the official high priest, he was led to the home of Annas who was the ex-high priest and the power behind the throne of the high priest, according to John 18, 12 through 14, and John 18, 19 through 23. When the scribes and the elders were assembled, Cyapas had gathered a group of the Sanhedrin to pass judgment on Jesus. After the break of dawn, the Sanhedrin gathered again, this time an official session and they conducted the trial described in Luke chapter 22, verses 66 to 71. Peter followed him at a distance to see the end. Peter was determined to prove wrong Jesus' prediction that he would de- deny and forsake him at his death. So that's why I always love study as far as in looking deeper into the word and looking deeper at scripture. Because it was something that I learned, you know, as far as in looking at the trials of Christ, that there were multiple ones that actually took place in that small amount of that small span. You know, the ones that come to mind, of course, are him before the Sanhedrin with Caiaphas. And of course, then the time that he was with Pilate. But there were there was another one that actually took place that is referenced in one of the other synoptic gospels, which is John. So and we're going to get deeper in that, too, as well, to kind of give us that complete picture. So I wanted to dig deeper because obviously when I look at the word Sanhedrin, I wanted to kind of give you an understanding of what that really meant. And it says, what was the Sanhedrin from LearnReligions.com? The great Sanhedrin, also spelled Sanhedrin, was the supreme council or court in ancient Israel. There were also smaller religious Sanhedrins in every town in Israel, but they were all supervised by the great Sanhedrin. The great Sanhedrin was comp- comprised of 71 sages, 
plus the high priest who served as his president. The members came from the chief priests, scribes, and elders, but there was no record on how they were chosen. Mm -hmm. So I liken it to our courts. Remember, in every state, we have a Supreme Court, the Florida Supreme mm -hmm. Court, Georgia Supreme Court. Then, of course, we have the Supreme Court and basically the law of the land, the national court. And that's what this great Sanhedrin was looking at. It was the great grand council, not the individual ones that were in cities and principalities. So we see that governing root and body. Will somebody please continue in the commentary? During the time of Roman governors such as Pontius Pilate, the Sanhedrin had jurisdiction only over the providence of Judea. The Sanhedrin had its own police force that could arrest people as they did Jesus Christ. While the Sanhedrin heard both civil and criminal cases and could impose the death penalty, in New Testament times, it did not have the authority to execute convicted criminals. That power was reserved for the Romans, which explains why Jesus was crucified, a Roman punishment rather than stoned according to Mosaic law. Mm -hmm. So that really brings out the whole text of it, you know, basically really puts it in the context that that group of people, that Sanhedrin was really kind of a puppet or a proxy of Rome. You know, even though they could hold their meetings, they still had to go down to the auspices of the rulers of the land, which was Rome. Next, will someone please just read about the Sanhedrin as we continue? The great Sanhedrin was the final authority on Jewish law, and any scholar who went against its decision was put to death as a rebellious elder or Zakim Mamre. Caiaphas was the high priest or president of the Sanhedrin at the time of Jesus' trial and execution. As a Sadducee, Caiaphas did not believe in the resurrection. He would have been shocked when Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead. Mm. Not interested in the truth, Caiaphas preferred to destroy this challenge to his beliefs instead of supporting it. The great Sanhedrin was comprised not only of the Sadducees, but also of the Pharisees. But it was abolished with the fall of Jerusalem and the destruction of the temple in 60 to 70 AD. Attempts to form Sahedrins have occurred in modern times, but have failed. Hmm. So we get a little backdrop on Caiaphas again, because remember, we've talked about the Sadducees and the Pharisees and their belief systems. And remember, the Sadducees were basically a religious political arm. They didn't believe in, you know, uh, an afterlife. They didn't believe in the idea of, you know, miracles and things of that nature. They were just basically using traditional religious posture to kind of govern and to rule. They were more on that side. So Jesus stuck out like a sore thumb to Caiaphas. He was automatically against him because basically his Sadducee beliefs could mean, oh, Jesus couldn't have done this. But it was that he didn't even allow himself to get into the understanding of who Jesus was as the son of God. So we see a lot of backstory. We see a lot of what really went pl took place during that time and why he was so angry and mad at him. You know, say something, do something because mm -hmm. he was basically challenging his beliefs. But see, the thing is, sometimes our beliefs need to be challenged by God because mm -hmm. he's the ultimate authority. He is the one that sets everything up. So it's mm -hmm. not us that makes the rules, it's him. So it hey. just puts it all into context. So it's really, really neat uh, uh, understanding. Uh, any other thoughts? All right. So it leads us to our study question. And it says, who were the first group of men to put Christ on trial according to the gospel of Matthew? <laughs> And before we answer, I wanted, I put this up and said, why would I ask this question according to the gospel of Matthew? John must have something different. No, but Matt, Matthew, uh, Matthew talked to who? He talked to a certain group and he was... Uh, to the Jews. So Matthew, that's why, uh, according to the gospel of Matthew, so Matthew was speaking 
or uh, recording from a uh, Jewish perspective or for the Jewish uh, Jewish perf uh, perceptions. Uh, that's it. <laughs> yeah, that's okay. Well, you, you actually are, are both into it. Actually, the, uh, Ms. Jackson is into it as well as far as, and yes, according to the Gospel of John, there was another person that was visited. And so, and you're right, he did come from that perspective 100%. So I wanted to kind of put the story totally together about the trials that took place. And I mm -hmm. want us to look at that Gospel of John and looking mm -hmm. at that 18th chapter and specifically at the 10th through 14th verse. And it reads, then Simon Peter, who had a sword, drew it and struck the high priest's servant, cutting off his ear. The servant's name was Malchus. Jesus commanded Peter, put your sword away. Shall I not drink the cup my father has given me? Then the detachment of soldiers with his commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to, Anna, to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year. So we see basically right after the arrest in the garden, he isn't taken to Caiaphas and the Sanhedrin. He's taken to the ex-president of the Sanhedrin, Annas, who still hold way and sway. And we find out that Ennis had a direct relationship to Caiaphas. He was his father-in-law. So obviously he went there first before he went to Caiaphas. Now in the gospel of Matthew, however, we just see specifically Caiaphas's and the Sanhedrin mentioned, but we also have that piece where he first went to Ennis. And it said, Caiaphas was the one who advised the Jewish leaders that it would be good if one man died for the people. So let's look at Annas from God Questions. Will someone please just read for us a little bit of that commentary? Annas in the Bible was a powerful high priest who played key roles in the execution of Jesus Christ and in the persecution of the early church. Annas was a appointed high priest of the <clears throat> Jerusalem temple of around AD 6 by Quirinius, the Roman governor of Syria. He officially served as high priest until AD 15, when he was removed from office by Valerius Gratus, a procurator of Judea. However, Annas continued to exercise considerable influence as head over the high priestly clan for many years after that, including the, the time of John the Baptist's and Jesus Christ's public ministries. During the high priesthood of Annas and Cyapas, the, the word of God came to John, son of uh, Zach Zacharian in the wilderness, and that's Luke uh, chapter three, verse two. Five of Anna's sons, the most notable being El Elzar and his son-in-law, Joseph Syapas, succeeded in, this, in the office of high priest. Syapas was, in fact, the official Roman appointed high priest at the time of Jesus Christ's arrest, trial, and execution. Then the chief priests and the elders of the people assembled in the place in the palace of the high priest, whose name was Syapis, and that's Matthew chapter 26, verse three. Mm. So we see basically this backstory about Annas and basically what he, who he was and how he was uh, not necessarily, not saying taken down, but basically how he came into play. And remember when in our study, we found out that in order for a high priest to be elected, there was something that had to happen. What was that? According to the, Jew, the Jewish law, we're looking, obviously, Rome took over. That priest had to die. So basically, that priest died. Then someone else came in. But in this, we see basically when Rome took over rule, they started electing the high priest. And that's basically why we see the rise of Caiaphas, basically, as a puppet of Rome. So it kind of puts the whole story together, you know, the... And I'd say the true priest, which was Annas, because obviously he didn't die. He still was there. 
was used more as a consultant, you know, and then now Caiaphas, i.e. the tool of Rome was the one who instituted it. And so the story gets so deep, you know, everything about it was out of order, you know, but we see that it had to take place in order for something awesome to happen, salvation, because obviously through it, Jesus went to the cross and of course died for our sins, and now we have achieved salvation through him. Does it make sense? Yes. Hmm. Will someone please continue? Annas was born into an affluent and influential family. His name in Greek was Hannas, meaning the Lord is gracious. As leader of the Sanhedrin, Annas sat at the height of Jewish acrostasy. He was wealthy, well-educated, and in league with the ruling Roman authorities. Even when he was no longer formally held to the title of high priest, Annas continued to command the power of the office. After Jesus was arrested, he was taken first to Annas for the, a preliminary investigation, proving that Annas, Annas's high priestly status stretched beyond the official position. Then the detachment of soldiers was its commander and the Jewish officials arrested Jesus. They bound him and brought him first to Annas, who was the father-in-law of Caiaphas, the high priest that year, John 18, 13. When Annas had finished questioning Jesus about his disciples and his teaching, he sent him to Caiaphas, John 18th chapter, 19 through 24th verses. All righty. So let us just look back into that scripture of John, verses 18, 19 through 24. And it said, remember, this is when Jesus went to Annas. Meanwhile, the high priest questioned Jesus about his disciples and his teaching. I have spoken openly to the world, Jesus replied. I have always taught in the synagogues or at the temple where all the Jews come together. I said nothing in secret. Why question me? Ask those who heard me, surely they know what I said. When Jesus said this, one of the officials nearby slapped him in the face. Is this the way you answer the high priest, he demanded? If I said something wrong, Jesus replied, testify to what is wrong. But if I spoke the truth, why do you strike me? Then Annas sent him bound to Caiaphas, the high priest. So we see basically the kangaroo court starts at the home of Annas. And then it's taken into the Sanhedrin, into its proper place in essence. But we see all of this innuendo, all of this backstory that takes place before uh, Jesus even gets to the elected high priest, Caiaphas. So just wanted to kind of bring it all together. And the answer to that study question is this. Caiaphas, the high priest, the teachers of the law, the elders, the total Sanhedrin, basically. That was that body. Any questions? All right. Amen. Let us, oh, good. Let us continue. All righty. Will someone please take back? Now we're going back into our commentary of Matthew 26 and looking at that council, of course, uh, that was read in, of course, the scripture of uh, the Gospel of Matthew. So, will someone please read the commentary? Now the chief priest, the elders, and all the council. This nighttime trial was illegal according to the Sanhedrin's own laws and regulations. According to Jewish law, all criminal trials must begin and end in the daylight. Therefore, though the decision to condemn Jesus was already made, they conducted a second trial in daylight in Luke 22, 66 through 70, 71st verse. Because they knew the first one, the real trial had no legal standing. This was only one of many illegalities made in the trial of Jesus. According to Jewish law, only decisions made in the official meeting place were valid. The first trial was held at the home of Caiaphas, the high priest. We see everything about this was wrong. <laughs> there, was, there was nothing that was done in order. There was nothing that was done correctly. It was just done out of sheer, I dislike this guy. He challenges our authority and belief. 
So we're just going to get rid of it. You know what I mean? It doesn't matter what our law even says. We're going to do it the way we want to do it because we simply want a guilty verdict and we want to condemn him to death. You know, so you see where all of this starts to go together and it really makes sense of, oh my gosh, I mean, this is just horrible. But he did all of that for us. And that's why we see in the Garden of Gethsemane where he's just struggling with it because that humanities piece is like, I know it's about to happen. They're about to just you know, berate me in these different trials. They're about to do all of these things to me and then I'm going to die. So yes, it was it was definitely a heavy weight, but Jesus took it and he would do it again, which is awesome. So these are all, uh, will someone please continue to read the commentary? Sorry, looking at the uh, problems, why this was couldn't have been a real uh, court. According to Jewish law, criminal cases could not be tried during the Passover season. According to Jewish law, only an acquittal could be issued on the day of the trial. Guilty verdicts had to wait one night to allow for feelings of mercy to rise. According to Jewish law, all evidence had to be guaranteed by two witnesses who were separately examined and could not have contact with each other. According to Jewish law, false witness was punishable by death. Nothing was done to the many false witnesses in Jesus's trial. According to Jewish law, a trial always began by bringing forth evidence for the innocence of the accused before the evidence of guilt was offered. This was not the practice here. Hmm. So we've seen not only the way it was performed, i.e. taking him to Annas, who had nothing to do with it because he had no power, according to the Sanhedrin, then obviously taking him to the Sanhedrin in an evening session, which was incorrect, obviously then having all of these idiosyncrasies, all of these things not performed in it, everything about, like I said, the trial was a sham. And it was definitely set up just to give a guilty verdict. So obviously they could condemn him to death. Amen. So, so commentary on Matthew 26, 57 through 63 from Enduring Word. And it said the council sought false testimony against Jesus to put him to death, but found none. This is a remarkable testimony to the life and integrity of Jesus. For having lived such a public life and performed such a public ministry, it was difficult to find even false testimony against him. This fellow said, I am able to destroy the temple of God and build it in three days. After all the false witnesses had their say, Jesus was finally charged with threatening to destroy the temple as, a mo as in a modern day bomb threat. Clearly Jesus had destroyed this temple and in three days I will raise it up. John 2, 19. But his glorious prophecy of his resurrection was twisted into a terrorist threat. John 2.21 makes it clear that he was speaking of the temple of his body. So we see that even in this, they, well, they were so blinded by their disgust for Christ, they didn't even understand what was truly happening and what was going on and what he meant by what he, when he said, of course, in three days, this temple will be destroyed, but in three days, I will raise it up. So yes, it was just confusion personified. Let us continue in commentary. Will someone please read? Do you answer nothing? Jesus sat silently until he was commanded by the office of the high priest to answer the accusations against him. Remarkably, Jesus kept silent and answered nothing until it was absolutely necessary in obedience for him to speak. Jesus could have mounted a magnificent defense here, calling forth all the various witnesses to his deity, power, and character. The people he taught, the people he healed, the dead risen, the blind who see, even the demons themselves testified to his deity. But Jesus opened not his mouth. He was led as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before its shearers is silent. So he opened not his mouth. Isaiah 53rd chapter, seventh verse. Mm -hmm. His was the silence of patience, not of indifference, of courage, not of cowardness. And the high priest answered and said to him, 
I put you under oath by the living God. Tell us if you are the Christ, the son of God. Seeing the trial going badly, Caiaphas confronted Jesus, acting more as an accuser than an impartial judge. Hmm. I tell you, in that last piece, it really puts it to home. Because remember, Caiaphas was a Sadducee. And basically, we see where his theo theology, I, his understanding of God was so twisted. Because he put it in the context of oaths and basically swearing by God. That's how he used it. That's the power he put to it. Not the love, the understanding, the comfort that's supplied by God. So he puts that piece of it out there. Then he says, then tell us, are you the son of God? You know, he invoked this power that he knew nothing about that he didn't believe in, because remember, he didn't believe in the miracles. He didn't believe in angels. He didn't believe in demon possession. But still in that, he still used it. I mean, like I said, it's just uh, all over, just bad. <laughs> just, mm -hmm. that, that's all you can say, just bad, just bad. <laughs> so let us go now back into scripture. Will someone please read Matthew, the 26th chapter, verses 64 through 68. You have said so, Jesus replied, but I say to all of you, from now on, you will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of the mighty one and coming on the clouds of heaven. Then the high priest tore his clothes and said, he has spoken blasphemy. Why do we need any more witnesses? Look, now you have heard the blasphemy. What do you think? He is worthy of death, they answered. Then they spit in his face and struck him with their fists. Mm -hmm. Others slapped him and said, prophecy to us, Messiah, who hit you? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I tell you. So we see finally Jesus breaks his peace. You know what I mean? And basically said, you have said so. And basically he says, and from now on, you'll see the son of man sitting on the right hand of the mighty one and coming in the clouds. Of course, and then God was just gets belligerent, rips his clothes and says, you heard the blasphemy. And then they were already ready for it. So what do you what do you say? Oh, he's worthy of death. Well, they had already decided that before they even arrested him in Gethsemane, you know. So and then now they just add insult to injury by spitting on him and slapping him and just testing him. And he still took it, though. So that's the thing. He still <laughs> took it for us. So we're looking at the commentary and it says, it is as you said, instead of defending himself. Jesus simply testified to the truth. He was indeed the Christ, the son of God. He answered as briefly and as directly as possible. You will see the son of man sitting at the right hand of power. Jesus added this one word of warning. He warned them that though they sat in judgment of him now, he would one day sit in judgment of them mm. and with far more binding judgment. Mm. So it's funny, the enemy thought he had won and was winning, but was still losing, you know, just because the end game was salvation. And obviously, and of course, looking forward to that com second coming of Christ, of course, the rapture prior, but it just puts everything into perspective when we look at this breakdown as far as what was really going on in that time and at that trial. So it leads us to our study question for, the, uh, for tonight. I'm actually gonna end with this one and it said, Study question 2A, and I actually broke it down into part one into part two. It said, Christ was silent at the beginning of the trial. What action from the high priest forced him to speak? When he, when he swore, um, um, when Cyopas commanded him uh, on the... Um, he swore, he swore on God. He swore on God. <laughs> Are you his son? You know, pretty yeah. much in those words. Right. right. So, You're Jesus. exactly right. That's exactly. When Jesus spoke after Caiaphas, Caiaphas put him under oath. So yes, guaranteed. That's what kind of sparked it, you know. And basically, I love it because he didn't say, oh, yeah. He said, you have, you have said. <laughs> you said it. That's right. You said it. You have said it. I, I, it, it basically breaks into that understanding of, you know, him being there in judgment, but also him being there in power. And I think this is a good place for us to uh, leave tonight, but obviously just asking any questions, concerns, comments. Well, it's always a good uh, 
a good study and always I, I read something uh, just the other day and it it surprised me but it it shouldn't have but it was in reference to scripture and how you can read a verse multiple times and and get something different every time out of it right and that's part of the the bible study right because you you we share and we learn from <laughs> from the shepherd and so we uh we grow in the spirit <laughs> amen 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 so, so, and i i this is just so enlightening um from john's perspective i as mm -hmm. brother benny said i mean i've read the scriptures taught the scriptures for many years but i don't ever i don't think i recall hearing mm -hmm. what i've heard tonight Right. Amen. No, you're, you're so right with that. And I'm not gonna lie to you, it was a surprise to me as well, you know, because when, when we study, usually when we're thinking about the death of Christ, we look at the Sanhedrin, you know what I mean? Obviously, mm -hmm. the first trial, then we look to, of course, Pilate, and we're going to get into that. But that little piece that is in John about Annas and who he was and what the significance of that, I mean, it, it's kind of glossed over, you know what I mean? So, yeah, I just think that was just a great part. And I was, I, I tell you, if you're not learning in Bible study, no matter who you are, then you, yes. <laughs> you, yeah. you think you have it all, then yeah, you don't. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's right. So true. Right. There is, there is so much to gain. <laughs> amen. 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 So definitely. Perfect, perfect. Well, if all hearts and minds are set. Oh, before we go tonight, I just wanted to, uh, tell uh, well, all, our, all of our Greater Fort Clark family and friends that I did hear from Sister Jasmine and Sister Tiffany uh, concerning uh, Pearl Corbett, and she is now placed in hospice care. They actually put her there uh, yesterday. So just wanted to keep that family uplifted, um, definitely mm -hmm. keeping uh, them in prayer. Uh, and uh, we will, you know, we will continue. We'll just continue. But I just wanted to make sure that everyone was aware and I'm definitely going to uh, send out an email, but that uh, was brought to my attention. I, like I said, I talked with both of them yesterday and Thank they're you. just saying that this is where we are. Thank you. Wow. With that, let us pray. Amen. Father God, we come to you this evening again, God, just understanding that no matter what we see, you are still in control. And that, God, you sit high and you look low. And when we say that, we understand that you are looking at us and that you're keeping us and that you are watching out for us. And before we close, God, we just want you just to be over the Corbett family and our greater Fort Clark family. Yes, yes, Lord. God, just comfort us and just keep us, God, in this time that's no words can be said, God, but you know. Mm -hmm. Lord, we just lean on you right now just for understanding, for clarity, and for wisdom, oh God. And we ask, God, that your hand be moved in this situation. And Lord, we just pray for those on our Bible study tonight, God, that they have wisdom, that they have understanding from the red word, that they do take it with them and that they do keep it and that they hold it in their hearts. So that that wisdom is shared, it sparks someone to want to learn a little more about Christ Jesus. We love you, God. We honor you. And we thank you for all you've done and for all you do. Forth in Christ Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 All right. Thank you, Sister Melissa, for the link. Oh, oh thank you. <laughs> oh, you're welcome. Yeah. All right. Well, God bless you. I hope everyone has thank a good you, evening. Pastor. Like I said, definitely um, just want to keep uh, everybody uplifted and keep us together in family. Thank you. Absolutely. So Pastor, and hello, hello everyone lady. else. <laughs> Oh, hello, hello, First Lady hello. Pamela. And if there's anything, anything, please just let me know. No, I would definitely make, like I said, I'm definitely uh, going to make the church aware so we can just all yes. be in prayer together. Yes. yes. I'd seen Tiffany and um, a couple of the kids at the gym a couple mornings last week, but um, I did not reach out this Sunday, which right. is my typical day to reach out. So thank you. Mm -hmm. All right. Y'all, right. you take care. Have a good evening. All right, you too. Okay, guys. All right, everyone, stay safe.